these ripples, repeated ripples, in an area where there's nothing else like it. This is the fingerprints of the flood. That's yeah. what it is. Wow. In 1966, a well-known scientist released a book with information that could impact everyone on Earth. But before anyone could read it, it was classified by the CIA. We only learned about it a few years ago when it was declassified. But the CIA only released 57 pages of the original 284-page manuscript. And those pages have been, in the CIA's own words, sanitized. Now, why does the CIA think this book is so dangerous that they had to hide it from the public for 60 years and continue to hide most of it? Well, it's because the man who wrote it describes the end of the world. In 1966, former McDonnell Douglas engineer, Dr. Chan Thomas, released a book called The Adam and Eve Story. Now that title might sound like he's being cute, but he's actually being literal. This book is about the end of the world as we know it. Thomas presents evidence of a coming shift in the Earth's poles that creates a cataclysm. And Thomas says these pole shifts are cyclical, that on regular intervals, a disaster wipes out almost all human life and we start over again in the Stone Age. He says we're actually the sixth advanced civilization to evolve on Earth. There may have been even more civilizations that have been here, but the further back you go, the harder it is to know for sure because some of these civilizations occupied continents that no longer exist. Now, Thomas isn't the first scientist to publish this theory. In 1958, almost 10 years before the Adam and Eve story, Charles Hapgood published The Earth's Shifting Crust, which discussed the Earth crustal displacement hypothesis. This theory says that sometimes the Earth spins really fast and the continents are rearranged. When Hapgood proposed the idea of continental drift, it was called pseudoscience but Hapgood had his supporters. In fact, Albert Einstein wrote the forewords for two of his books. Now, of course, we know that Hapgood was right. The continents do move. They drift apart and collide together over and over again and have done so for almost 4 billion years. Pangaea was the supercontinent that broke apart to form the land masses that exist today. But before Pangaea, there was a the supercontinent Gondwana, which existed for 400 million years. Before Gondwana, there was Pinocchio. Before that, Rodinia, Columbia, Atlantica, Arctica, Kennerland, Ur, and Valbara. These were all supercontinents that eventually broke apart and reformed. After working with Einstein and a few other scientists, Charles Hapgood released the book, The Path of the Pole, as an update to his previous theories. In this book, Hapgood suggested that the Earth's poles are constantly moving. Again, this piece of pseudoscience was eventually proven true. Hapgood believed that a pole shift between 15 and 40 degrees occurred around 9600 BC, or 11,600 years ago, yes. Younger Dryas. Now, the Piri-Reis map is something that has baffled scientists for hundreds of years. On the Piri-Reis map is the continent of Antarctica. But Antarctica wasn't discovered until 1820. And Piri-Reis claimed the information on his map came from much older maps. If Charles Hapgood was right and the Earth's axis was shifted 15 degrees from where it is now, Antarctica wouldn't be completely covered in ice. Hapgood believed an Ice Age civilization long forgotten mapped the coast thousands of years ago. Though many of Hapgood's theories have proven to be true, the Ice Age pole shift is still controversial. We do know the poles shift over time. We also know the continents drift over a very long period of time. But Dr. Chan Thomas, in his book, The Adam and Eve Story, says the shift happens in less than a day. Chan Thomas describes in detail what this will be like, and it's worse than any Hollywood disaster movie ever conceived far worse. Chan Thomas begins his book with a chapter that describes exactly what we'll experience during this pole shift event. With a rumble so low as to be inaudible, then fueling into a thundering roar, the earthquake starts. Only it's not like any earthquake in history. In California, mountains shake like ferns in a breeze. A mighty Pacific rears back and piles up into a mountain of seawater more than two miles high, then starts its race eastward. The wind attacks, shredding everything in supersonic bombardment. The mountain of Pacific seawater follows the wind eastward, burying Los Angeles and San Francisco as if they were but grains of sand. Across the continent, the thousand mile per hour wind wreaks unholy vengeance everywhere, mercilessly. Now here's why there's such violent wind. The Earth spins about a thousand miles per hour. We don't feel this because everything is spinning together. The land, the water, the atmosphere. But Thomas says that when the pole shift happens, the Earth's air and water continue to spin, but the land masses stop. In many places, the Earth's molten sublayer breaks through and spreads a sea of white hot liquid fire. In a fraction of a day, 
All vestiges of civilization are gone, and the great cities, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago, Dallas, New York, Boston, are nothing but legends. Barely a stone is left where millions walked just a few hours ago. Now think of what would happen if you were in a car going a thousand miles per hour that suddenly stopped. Now think of what would happen if a large city going a thousand miles per hour suddenly stopped. Skyscrapers would collapse. Millions of people would be thrown around like they were in a food processor. Very few people would survive that. But survivors are the unlucky ones because moving across the country at the speed of sound is a two mile high wall of water, mud, and debris. South America finds the Andes not high enough to stop the violence. In less than a day, the entire continent is burned by molten earth fire, buried under miles of violent seas, then turned into a frozen hell. Everything freezes, man, beast, plant, and mud in less than four hours. When the shift happens, the land on Earth stops moving, so the sun stops moving in the sky. That means one side of the Earth is going to get really hot and the other side really cold. A temperature drop of 180 degrees. That means even the warmest parts of the planet are going to be 80 degrees below zero. Everything is frozen solid within four hours. Europe cannot escape. The Alps, Pyrenees, Urals are shunken then heaved even higher when the wall of seawater strikes. Western Africa and the sands of the Sahara vanish. The fury marches on for six days. During the sixth day, the ocean starts to settle. The Bay of Bengal Basin, just east of India, is now at the North Pole. The Pacific Ocean, just west of Peru, is at the South Pole. New ice caps begin to form in the new polar areas. Greenland and Antarctica, now rotating equatorially, emerge with verdant tropical foliage. Thomas is predicting a 90 degree shift of the Earth's axis basically turning the planet on its side. The poles move to the equator, and the equator moves to the poles. New York lies at the bottom of the Atlantic, covered by unbelievable amounts of mud. Of San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, Dallas, and Boston, not a trace is left. The cataclysm has done its work and drives the pitiful few who survive into a new Stone Age. We join Noah, Adam and Eve, Atlantis, Mew, and Olympus and Jesus joins Osiris, Taora, Zeus, and Vishnu. In the first chapter of his book, Dr. Thomas paints a terrifying future. But how likely is it? In the next few chapters, Thomas goes on to not only prove his pole shift is possible, that it's happened before and will happen again very soon. In fact, there are signs that it may have already begun. Every culture has a flood myth. Abrahamic religions have Noah's flood. The Mayans have the Hudakan flood, where the word hurricane comes from. Ancient Hawaiians have the Nu'u flood. The Sumerians wrote about a flood in Gilgamesh. Europe, Asia, Pacific Islanders, and native tribes from all over America. They all talk about a great flood that cleansed the earth so civilization could start again. Now, one myth is just folklore. Two myths are a coincidence. 40 flood myths? This starts to look less like a myth and more like actual history. Now, on this channel, we typically associate great floods with the end of the last ice age, the Younger Dryas. And core samples provide solid evidence that this happened. But what's interesting is, Thomas said the last great flood wasn't 11,500 years ago, but 6,500 years ago. Now, in the 1960s, there was very little, if any, proof of this. But a few years ago, archaeologists found evidence of the Gunyu flood myth in China. Evidence of a great flood has been found in the Mediterranean and in the Black Sea. These discoveries put the flood between 6,500 and 7,000 years ago more recent than the Younger Dryas, and right when Thomas says it happened. Chen Thomas provides the dates of other floods. The Younger Dryas is about 11,500 years ago. Before that, a flood 18,500 years ago. And this is exactly the time when the Bering Land Bridge went underwater. Before that, 29,000 years ago, which was the end of the Wisconsin Glacial Period. And before that, 43,800 years ago. But global floods aren't controversial. We know they happened. What is controversial is the claim that advanced civilizations existed before each of the floods. Mainstream archaeology and paleontology say the first civilization emerged in Mesopotamia 6,500 years ago. But what if that was just the last reboot? When we look at the erosion around the base of the Great Sphinx, we see patterns that were formed by running water. Vast amounts of water moving at tremendous speeds. But if this is water erosion, that means the Sphinx was created before the last flood 6,500 years ago which is before the emergence of the Egyptian civilization. Archaeologists hate that idea. And they really hate the idea that the Sphinx was built over 10,000 years ago. 
But there's other evidence of a cataclysmic pole shift, specifically of a great mud flood and a sunken continent, I mean Atlantis. Chan Thomas makes some pretty extreme claims in the Adam and Eve story. Extraordinary claims need extraordinary evidence. In his dialogues, Plato famously introduced the world to Atlantis, the advanced utopian society that was destroyed in a cataclysm. Now, until definitive proof of Atlantis is found, it will continue to be considered a mythical land. But that won't and shouldn't stop people from looking for it. There is a geological feature in Northwest Africa called the Rishat structure, also called the Eye of the Sahara. It's about the right size and shape for Atlantis. Plato described the city as concentric rings with a waterway flowing out. But even among Atlantis believers, there's debate about whether this is a man-made structure or a natural one. But what I find fascinating is near the eye of the Sahara and all over the planet, you'll see large ripples in the landscape. Now on the ground, these look like rolling hills, but they're actually about 50 feet high, the size of a five-story building. And they were caused by water, a lot of water. This is one of the craziest things you'll ever see. This is right this, these ripples, repeated ripples in an area where there's nothing else like it. This is the fingerprints of the flood. That's yeah. what it is. Wow. The water here, Joe, that did this, the way to visualize this is to again, begin to think a tsunami. Here, what you have to visualize is a tsunami sweeping over the land that's over a thousand feet deep. And it's sweeping down over this land at probably two or 300 million cubic feet per second, which is an inconceivable amount of water. But Atlantis isn't the only place lost to this disaster. On the other side of the world, we have another lost continent. This is called the Land of Mew. Mew is described by Augustus Le Plongeon and later by James Churchward, both of whom translated very old texts from the Maya and India. Both of these cultures on opposite sides of the world describe a vast continent in the Pacific that reached Hawaii in the north, and as far south as Easter Island, and as far west that it almost reached the islands of Japan. James Bramwell and William Scott Elliott, both proponents of this theory, claim the continent was destroyed in a cataclysm 11,500 years ago. There's that date again. The Yanaguni Monument off the coast of Japan is said to be the underwater ruins of Mew. Namadal in Micronesia is considered to be the southern part of Mew. The site is full of structures made of enormous logs of volcanic rock. Nobody knows who built this or how, but their society was advanced. Just recently, LIDAR imaging from the air shows that at one time, Namadal had an artificial irrigation system that could bring fresh water to residents all over the area. The eastern part of Mew is Easter Island, and there could be evidence of a cataclysm there. On Easter Island are the Moai statues, and you've seen these, it's lots of heads, about a thousand actually. And most people don't realize that these statues have bodies buried deep underground. So there are two options. One, whoever built the statues first dug holes, then buried 30 foot tall, 80 ton statues up to their necks, then filled in the holes. Or two, the statues were completely above ground, but at some point were buried by something. And look at Easter Island. It's a tiny island in the middle of nowhere. At one point, 12,000 people lived there. Where did they come from? Mainstream anthropology says that people from Polynesia took a canoe out thousands of miles in the middle of the Pacific and hoped for the best. But if the continent of Mew was real, then they could have just walked there. This could also explain why Polynesian languages share similarities to Greek, and maybe why on Easter Island, they worshiped a sun god called Ra'a, which is awfully close to the Egyptian sun god Ra. And the connections don't stop there. There are similarities between Greek Egyptian and even Indian gods, as if all these cultures intermingled or came from a single source. Chan Thomas lays out some good evidence for the cyclical cataclysm theory. But the big questions are how and when will it happen? Well, you're not gonna like the answer. Dr. Chan Thomas lays out a compelling argument for a coming global cataclysm, but when? Well, to answer that, we have to understand how it happens. In the story of Adam and Eve, Thomas includes a diagram showing the cross-section of the Earth and a description of the process. The process of a cataclysm is known now. Look at the cross-section of the Earth inside the front cover. You'll see two molten layers, the orange ones. The important one is the thin molten layer starting 60 miles down, extending 60 miles deeper to 120 miles below the surface of the Earth. The thick, deep molten layer starting 1,800 miles down at the bottom of the mantle and extending 1,300 miles deeper is the outer core. Seismology has proven these two orange layers to be molten, and they are white hot, over 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Now, Dr. Thomas was able to predict seismic activity all over the world. Inside the Earth, the electrical and magnetic structure of the interior makes the layers act as if they were near solid. As long as the magnetic and electrical structure of the Earth maintains its orderliness, it keeps rotating on axis in a normal manner. Every few thousand years, the magnetic and electrical orderliness in the shallow molten layer is disorganized, to the extent that the shallow molten layer is allowed to act as a free liquid, which then serves as a lubricant for the ice caps to pull the shell around the Earth's interior so as to have the ice caps shift about 90 degrees into the torrid zone. When this event occurs, the layer beneath the Earth's crust turns from solid to liquid, then the land masses can slide around freely and the weight of the ice caps then yanks the Earth off axis. In one quarter to one half a day, the geographic poles move to the torrid zone and all hell lets loose. The atmosphere and the Earth's oceans don't shift with the shell, they just keep on rotating west to east, and at the equator, that speed is about 1,037 miles per hour. So while the shell shifts with the poles going to the equator, the winds and oceans continue eastward, blowing and flooding across the Earth at supersonic speeds, inundating continents with water miles deep, destroying everything with which man has ever dealt, including himself. That's a summary of the process. Chan Thomas updated his prediction in 1993 and said the shift would happen in seven years, around the year 2000. He mentioned that Nostradamus and Edgar Cayce made the same prediction. There's a lot more to the Adam and Eve story, but those are the bullet points.